As a reminder, this podcast represents the opinions of Dr. Colby Salerno and Dr. Aline Gregosian and our guests to the show. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only, and because each person is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. The views and opinions expressed in the podcast are our own and do not represent that of our employers. And lastly, in no way does listening, reading, emailing, or interacting on social media with our content establish a doctor-patient relationship. Thank you and enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 4 of Both Sides of the Stethoscope. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Colby Salerno, and I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Aline Gregosian. Hi, everyone. And today we have on a special guest who we will be interviewing. As you'll recall from our last podcast, sorry again for such a long time in between episodes. Aline and I got very busy with fellowship and just couldn't get around to it, but we're very excited because tonight we'll be interviewing Madeline Hallam, who is a registered dietitian, and she has her master's in health sciences, and she also has a specialty in geriatric nutrition. And most importantly, she also takes care of a ton of transplant patients. So we have a lot of questions for her that she'll be answering tonight. So welcome on, Madeline. Thank you so much for having me. So I guess we can get started with the questions. Is that okay? Sounds good. So what's your story? Like what got you into all of this? And um, and how did you pick transplant and geriatrics as your specialties? Well, I'd like to say that I was just really interested in cooking or food, but I actually had an eating disorder in college. So I think that's why I was seared into all of these nutrition courses, because I really wanted to learn more about food. Unfortunately, I wanted to learn about it so I could kind of harm myself even more, learn how to lose even more weight. So I didn't really realize that was why I went into nutrition until about probably three years ago when I was listening to another speaker explain why she became a dietitian. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is me. And I think if I didn't love my job right now, I'd probably be having a midlife crisis. <laughs> Because I was wondering, you know, if I didn't have an eating disorder, would I have gone to med school or went to art school? I just wonder what my life would look like if that things were different. Right. Because of something that you went through, you ended up going into this field, but you also happen to like it. So I do. I really love it. So maybe there was a reason to all that madness. <laughs> yeah. What got you into specifically geriatrics uh, and transplant? I worked with a lot of nursing homes right after my internship. And so I really love old people. Like even in college, I worked as a volunteer in a hospice area where I'd read and paint people's fingernails. So I was always interested in older folks. And so I really liked geriatric nutrition and that specialty. And I worked with several consulting agencies with geriatric nutrition for several years. And then I wanted to do something a little more stable and kind of go back to the clinical setting and work with other dietitians. I gave Vanderbilt a call because I did my internship there. And luckily they had an opening. I, I remember like yesterday sitting in my car and uh, my future boss saying, have you ever heard of a VAD? And I was like, no, but it sounds cool. <laughs> And then I began working at Vanderbilt. I was their ventricular assist device dietitian, and I had some other general floors. I didn't even realize VAD patients needed their own, like, different diet. Yes. And, well, I think it's a requirement, too, as a VAD program. They have to have a designated dietitian uh. who's providing assessments for them and education. So that's really how I got started with the VAD program. And then... You know, it exploded because I think I was at Vanderbilt in 2013 is when I started working there. And since then, our VAD population has increased so much. And then our transplants also increase. We're, we're like, I keep th I think the news has been saying we're number one for volume in the whole world. So I ended up asking um, if I could take care of the transplant patients as well, because I had such a good relationship with all of my VAD patients. I had followed some of them for about four years. And then when they got their transplant, I was no longer their, you know, dietitian. So I asked if I could be, because it just made sense uh, for patient quality of care. And I just had such a great relationship with those patients already. So that's how I got started with the heart transplant program at Vanderbilt. 
did you need any special training or did you have to kind of just learn on the job of, of what the special needs of this patient population was? I did have special training. We have competencies as transplant dietitians that we have to do in continuing ed for each specific organ that we treat. It's about one one hour of continuing ed for each organ a year. So it's not that much, but at Vanderbilt, I have a lot of opportunities uh, to do a lot of continuing ed, and it's something I, I'll always like to do. This year, I attended the the NATCO, the National Association of Transplant. They had a nutrition conference specific to transplant nutrition, so that was really fun. And my other question is, what is the difference between, because you keep saying like nutrition and dietitian, what's the difference between nutritionist and a registered dietitian? That's a good question. I think a lot of people are confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm always like, I don't know. They yeah. do sound the same, but they are quite different. There are several states that don't regulate who can call themselves a nutritionist. So there are some people maybe like on Instagram that have a food blog or are into bodybuilding and they might call themselves a nutritionist and they can actually give out, you know, medical nutrition therapy advice. So a lot of states don't regulate that where some do and you have to have some specific coursework and a license to say you're a nutritionist. But um, it's those people, you know, who don't really have a lot of training or expertise, like if the state isn't regulating them, calling themselves a nutritionist, you know, I fear sometimes that those people can give out bad advice that can be pretty harmful to people, especially if they don't know the difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian. On the other hand, a dietitian like me has to have a minimum of a bachelor's degree and they will require a master's in 2024. And the coursework has to be approved for from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics in order to get into an internship. So that coursework includes like organic chemistry, microbiology, uh, food system management, how to work in a restaurant. And then it has a lot of nutrition courses too, such as geriatric nutrition, pediatric nutrition. So it's, it's a, a large variety of nutrition work. And then once you complete all that college coursework, you can be eligible to get into a dietetic internship. And that is about 1,200 hours of uh, clinical supervised practice, and they're all over the country. They range from about six to 12 months long. And um, I did mine at Vanderbilt, and I'm now a preceptor for our students, so they'll get experience with me with Oregon medical nutrition therapy, and then they'll also do things in the community like school nutrition and women, infant, and children's government programs. And then after you complete your internship, we sit for a board exam. So we have a dietitian exam, and then we have to keep up our license and dietitian credentials by doing about 75 hours of continuing ed every five years. So they are um, very different. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Actually, like, very different. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And I think we have a lot of transplant patients who listen to this. And I think they, me included, I did not know the level of schooling that goes into this. And I think it's so reassuring to know that after transplant, the person who is educating you on what to eat and how to eat it has so much knowledge base in this field specifically. I think it's very reassuring and really awesome. Oh, that's good. And NatCo has now they have a specialty that they're offering. It's to be like a certified clinical transplant dietitian. So I'm halfway there for my application, but I'm hoping to become to have that certification. I think a lot of hospitals across the country will probably soon be asking that all their transplant dietitians do that. Do you only take care of heart transplant patients or all transplants? I mainly help the um I'm mainly the designated heart transplant dietitian, but I do a lot of dual organs such as heart, liver, liver, heart, lung, and heart, kidney. And then when my other transplant dietitians are off, I will help them with their, their work. So we do, I do a little bit of cross coverage, but mainly heart. Do your recommendations change depending on what organs have been transplanted? That's a good question. It kind of depends on what phase of care they are in. So post-transplant, the recommendations are pretty strict as far as like the food safety guidelines don't change, but 
the other aspects of care are definitely patient centered and depend on like how that patient's breathing after transplant, what their blood sugars look like, what their lab values are. So it, it can be different, but overall it's usually the same amount of calories and protein and the diets post transplant are about the same. Wow. There's like so much that goes into this that I had really no idea about. I guess it also matters like what medications they're on, right? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the steroids and um, yeah. Cause I'm, for prograph, like my potassium is always really high. And so they always tell me, you know, it has to be a certain level. Don't eat this, don't eat that. And I know like some of the other immunosuppressants don't necessarily like increase your potassium levels. I know. Um, it's unfortunate. Like some patients get, will get diarrhea and have mm-hmm. uncontrolled blood sugar. So, and some other people have it pretty easy and they don't have those side effects. So it's definitely very different. Yeah. Do you regularly see transplant patients as an outpatient or do you just work in the hospital? I do. I go to the clinic now as well. So I don't send all my patients to see me post-transplant. I usually will get a referral if they really struggled as an inpatient. So if they're really malnourished or I want to keep a closer eye on them because maybe they were frailty scores were going down or I was concerned about their blood sugar management, I will see them in the outpatient setting. And... I really feel like before COVID, I was seeing all transplant patients automatically um, within the first three months just to make sure that they had a good idea about the transplant diet uh, now that they were in the real world because you know how things can change once you leave the hospital. Oh, yeah, for sure. (laughs) And I think there's research that shows like when you do educations in the hospital setting, about like 80% of it is is gone by the time you leave the room. Like people, oh, that's so interesting. It's just not a very good learning environment because there's so much distractions and people are usually sleep deprived or excited yeah. to leave. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I remember when I was in the hospital, I actually got quizzed every morning about my pills because oh they didn't God. think that I would retain the information. Um, yes. And the, 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 uh, we use something called teach back. I don't know if you guys do that too, as physicians, where you ask the patient to repeat like their favorite part or, um, or I'll say, so what fruits are you supposed to avoid after transplant so that I can hear that they are understanding it instead of saying, do you understand? And they're like, yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's really interesting. I guess sometimes we do that. I didn't realize that that's like a whole different way of like interacting with patients, but I don't think I do it like regularly, but that's a really good idea. Yeah. It's called the teach back method. It's pretty Mm -hmm. popular at Vanderbilt. You mentioned that you see some like, you know, a little bit out since their transplant. Aline is three years out. I'm 10 years out. Would you guide us differently depending on that? Or would we both have been lost already to nutritionist follow-up because we're so far out of transplant? (laughs) I would hope you wouldn't be lost, but At Vanderbilt right now, we don't have a protocol in place to see people that far out. It's kind of, um, you know, maybe it's something that we do need to do, but I always try to make sure that my patients know before they leave that they have a designated dietitian that is me. You know, here's my picture. Here's my name. Here's my email. You can send me a message basket that I'm I'm always available for you. So I, I know that they might forget that in 10 years, but, um, maybe that's some, maybe that's a area where we could have more improvement in. Yeah. We were talking about that on our last episode because I don't remember almost anything that was told to me. I remember no pomegranates, (laughs) no (laughs) pomegranates, no grapefruits. And I didn't realize that. I mean, I've worked with some patients for like five years now, but, um, yeah, that's, laughable, but also pretty bad. (laughs) Yeah, no, I agree. If it wasn't for the fact that I like work there and I work with transplant patients and I like see the dietitian regularly at work as a colleague, I Uh probably would forget a lot more. But I remember like my teaching in the hospital was very extensive. And I think I saw one as an outpatient like once maybe. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I haven't followed up with any as an outpatient in such a long time. And I wonder the same thing. Like it'd probably be really helpful to do that, especially now that like 
they're, they're, I'm on different medications, different doses of medications. Um, there's other things I have to worry about three years out. So, right. But maybe it's good that you haven't had a referral to the dietitian because <laughs> you're thriving and doing great. <laughs> you're right. I, I, I'll definitely take it as that's the reason. <laughs> <laughs> Not because we're terrible patients. I, the referrals I usually get are for people that maybe are starting to lose weight or failure to thrive, or they've gained too much weight after transplant, or they need help with, you know, potassium or magnesium levels. But I usually don't see people after the first year. Oh, okay. What, speaking of potassium, what are your favorite, the low potassium like foods, including fruits and vegetables? What do you recommend to your patients? Well, gosh, my personal favorites are really like cheese <laughs> and that loves cheese. I like brown rice and white rice as well. Those are low in potassium. I prefer whole wheat bread, but white bread is fine or white rolls. Mm -hmm. My favorite fruit would probably be have maybe mango or pears. They're pretty low in potassium oh, okay. and papaya. Huh. I don't really eat papaya that much, but I don't like the taste of it, but I do love mangoes. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big fan of tortillas. Those are really low in potassium. <laughs> Good to know. But sometimes I get frustrated because the doctors say your potassium levels are high. Mm -hmm. So please cut back on your potassium. But the doctors, in my opinion, aren't specific. So the patients just try to do like zero milligrams of potassium. Yeah. And... Of course, that's that's not right. I mean, no, normally people need around like 4,000 milligrams of, of potassium every day. So mm -hmm. if someone's trying to do lower, you can cut that by half, but it's definitely not zero. Yeah. Actually, I, when I saw one of the dietitians that works in the ICU just recently, like a month, two months ago, I was like, hey, Ellie, can you give me that sheet again with the low potassium foods? <laughs> and then she like circled everything for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, because my potassium was high, like one of the recent times that I checked. Um, but I, but she did tell me the same thing. She said, you have to be careful. Don't it doesn't mean you shouldn't eat any like no potassium at all. It just means you have to like, right. lower it. Yeah. I see that happen too with when people are on Warfarin. They're like, I can't have anything green. Oh, that's so no, you have yeah. to be consistent. I mean, it's sadly, I've had people like cut out everything with vitamin K. I mean, huh. that's mayonnaise, I mean, tomato sauce, like all kinds of stuff has vitamin K. Yeah. And then they come in to see me and the doctors are like, I think they're a little malnourished. And I'm like, yeah, because they're, oh. they're. Yeah, we definitely need to do a better job when we say things like lower your potassium or do this. We have to do a better job in explaining like. These are the foods or like, here's a referral to the, to nutrition, you know? Yeah. I think that would be great. Or you could say, mm -hmm. have the, the dietitian come talk to you more about it. I mean, yeah. I think that would be so nice. Yeah. I feel like a lot of your job is definitely patient centered as all of medicine is because you have patients who are diabetic, some who are not, some who have good kidney function, some who don't. Do you have a few general rules for the transplant community that you try and instill in that in them when you're seeing them as far as the diet post yeah like uh <laughs> the main avoidances i guess you could say oh yes um definitely those fruits that interact with your medications so we practice um at our transplant center no pomegranates no blood oranges and no grapefruit and then there's some evidence that maybe star fruit should be in there as well, but we haven't gotten together with our task force to implement that yet. Do you, does your center avoid star fruit? Have you ever heard that before? No, it wasn't on the list. No, but I've I also, not heard that. I've had blood orange too, so. <laughs> I know. I didn't know about the blood orange, so thanks, Madeline. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, those contain that um gosh i don't know how to say it the yeah the cyp morano comerans yeah oh. the p450 pathway so it can cause um the cyclosporine and tacro to build up and become toxic mm -hmm. but besides those besides that and the food safety guidelines i really don't put my patients on a strict diet i'm one of those dietitians that's pretty liberal i'm mm -hmm. not you know, there's some dietitians that are like, you can't ever eat a cheeseburger, but yeah. 
I tend to not do that. I feel like a lot of those rules can cause people, cause people to have more of a harmful relationship with food or feel guilty if they did have a cheeseburger. Right. So I, I do want them to protect their new heart though. So we definitely talk about, you know, fiber and the Mediterranean diet and heart healthy fats like olive oil and avocados and fatty fish and mm -hmm. a can of nuts and seeds and I think eggs are great too. So I definitely try to boost up their heart health, but I don't like to put them on any strict rules. That's a good way to practice, I think. Yeah. Some of my patients, I can tell they have a, a good relationship with food and it's well balanced. And then there's some of my patients, you know, that have a really unhealthy relationship with food and they're really fearful of gaining weight post transplant. And they're trying to, you know, cut back too much. And so I'm always trying to promote just a healthy general lifestyle. And I want them to have a good, healthy relationship with food too, and not fear it. And those are some things to avoid, but are there other things it's like, for example, the food safety guidelines, can we go over those? Like at least a couple of them? Sure. So I remember one of them was avoid like deli meats. Do you also say that? So you can have deli meats and luncheon meats and hot dogs, but they have to be reheated to kill that bacteria called listeria that likes to live on those refrigerated meats. Mm -hmm. So you're supposed to heat up your turkey or your deli meat to about 165 degrees to kill it. So you could zap it in the microwave or, you know, put it in a skillet. That Take goes, a low tier, Madeline. <laughs> <laughs> that goes the same for the hot dogs. I see. Okay. So you can have them. You just have to make sure it's cooked. Yes. Okay. Kind of like how pregnant women do nowadays. I think they tell that to pregnant people. Um, and this is where I was just quickly interject how I was <laughs> like, man, should patients have follow up? Because I maybe was told that when I initially had my transplant, but 10 years later, the amount of deli meat sandwiches that I've had probably would make your head spin. <laughs> <laughs> But and thankfully, knock on wood, I've done okay, but don't yeah, uh, do do what Madeline says, not what I do. Yeah, not what me and Kobe do at all. <laughs> well, it's interesting how some patients or some people are just so susceptible to foodborne illnesses like me. I am. I must have like a bad gut microbiome where I don't have that microorganism that kills salmonella. Because I mean, probably once or twice a year I get sick from yeah. a foodborne illness, but other people aren't affected by it hardly ever. Have you guys had any food poisoning lately? Not lately, but I had it once. Like before transplant, I probably had it like once a year or so and it was fine. You just like, you know, it, take a day off and, you know, de like hydrate and all that. But mm -hmm. after transplant last December, I had um, E. coli actually, and it was the worst. Like yeah. <laughs> I think I lost 10 pounds in just the, that week and it was... And I, I was hospitalized. I was on IV fluids, antibiotics, and everything. It was honestly the worst. Oh, no. Yeah. And I've caught stuff from people who have had stomach bugs. But mm -hmm. when it comes to food, I've never had any issues. Yeah, that's good. Oh, if you wanted me to go over some of the other things. Yes. yes. No unpasteurized cheeses or milks. So like no raw milk from the farmer's market. And just checking all your dairy products to make sure they are say that they're made with pasteurized milk. There are some soft cheeses like queso, feta, and brie that are not pasteurized, but I can usually find them in the grocery store where they're made with pasteurized milk. But that's something to think about as well. Like if you go to a local Greek place and you're going to get a Greek salad that has feta cheese, you probably want to ask your waiter, waitress, you know, is this that uh, pasteurize and usually they can let you know if it is or not. The other things too is just to wash your fruits and vegetables. We don't recommend any kind of food bleach or food sprays. You can just use running water and do a vigorous scrub or for things like broccoli and raspberries that have lots of holes and grooves, you can soak them with some vinegar and water and let them sit for about 10 minutes and rinse them with cold water. That's supposed to be a great way to get rid of any kind of bacteria and dirt. That's really good to know. I remember when I first got out of the hospital, my mom was like living with me for a few months and she was like washing everything with soap. <laughs> like I was like, mom, these grapes taste like Lysol. What is this? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So just like water and maybe a little bit of vinegar. That's good to know. She was probably so nervous. She went. I know she is. She's actually, she actually knows a lot more of the food stuff than I do. So like, I'll call her and I'll be like, oh, hey, I'm having like sushi with my friend. And she's like, you're not e- actually eating sushi, are you? I'm like, no, mom. It's like, <laughs> so she's really good at remembering all that stuff. She, when I was hospitalized, um, she talked to the dietitian like extensively every day. It was like the one thing that she really, really was uh, careful about and still is. <laughs> That's so nice. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the other restrictions are no raw alfalfa or bean sprouts. Those typically have a lot of bacteria. I think you've probably heard in the news like over the past 10 years where a lot of food chains have gotten rid of their alfalfa or bean sprouts because of salmonella. So we ask that if you want those to just have them cooked. So I think in like a pad thai dish, they're usually cooked or like a soup. But Yeah, I was going to ask. So if it's do we know if it's cooked? And because I, I know in like Thai food has it, like a lot of Asian foods have it. That's a good question. I mean, I think yeah. it is, but I guess yeah. I should probably ask. Yeah. yeah. I think that's most of the restrictions. Like you said, just um, no raw or undercooked meats and seafood. And yeah, I believe that's it. Those are usually the highlights. Um, I don't know if a lot of your patients know, hopefully they do, but there is a free USDA food safety booklet that you can get. We use it at our center and they are free. So you can just email the USDA for the books and they'll they'll mail you a bunch of them for no questions asked. (laughs) Oh, that's good to know. We'll put the website on our post, on our Instagram post. They have some, a bunch of free resources. They've got like a, is it done yet? which tells all the correct temperatures to cook your food to, to kill a foodborne illness or prevent one. And they have like free magnets and different booklets that are really great resources. So we touched upon this a little bit, but I like to go out to eat and there's definitely days or like nights I'll be coming home from work and um, I'll quickly grab like Chick-fil-A drive through When I'm going to these places, whether it's out to eat or through a fast food, um, drive through. Is there certain requests that I should be making certain things I should be looking out for? I don't know. I mean, I would say if it's a drive through, I don't know if you make any requests that it, I feel like it's going to be too late <laughs> because usually a fast food joint already has most of their food made. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say if the restaurant, you know, like kind of look sturdy when you're ordering your food or, you know, through the drive through window that it probably means it is dirty. So I probably wouldn't go back there. I guess you could also check some of their, um, you know, food safety scores. I don't remember what those are called. You know how the restaurants get the scores for cleanliness. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're in a restaurant too, I mean, definitely if you're ordering some food, if you felt comfortable, you could say, I'm a recent transplant patient or I've had a transplant. Can you make sure that my lettuce is washed really well or my food is cooked like the same and I'm ordering, you know, I really want it well done. I guess, you know, those are some tips, but it's just pretty risky in general to eat out, unfortunately, just because if you, even if you do all that or the food is really clean, still your waiter might be sick and not know it and he could kind of contaminate your food. So I think that, yeah, it's kind of sad news, isn't it? I mean, I want you to be able to eat out and I think you still should, but just knowing that there is some risk, but there's some things that you could do, like making sure your hands are really clean, avoiding like the self-serve ketchup dispensers, things like that, that might not often be clean or changed out. Sometimes those can have a lot of, of bacteria. Definitely. And I think, you know, Within the first year of transplant, there was, I probably didn't do any of this um, at all. And then kind of now, 10 years out, it, I've lessened it with mm-hmm. um, my immune suppression is so much less than it was initially. Like even just me compared compared to Aline, like the level of meds we're on, yeah. mm-hmm. our, response to, <laughs> our response to vaccines. I have zero antibodies at all, so. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> But that's definitely advice I give to my patients too, because they're like, I mean, do I have to do this for life? And I'm like, if you could just be really careful, at least the first year while you're getting Mm -hmm. to all your medications and you're still trying to heal 
I think that's the time when you should be really careful. Agreed. So thanks for answering all of these. Um, I have one last question for you, and it's what is your favorite part about being a transplant dietitian? Gosh, there's so many great things. I mean, just to be able to see the magic of a transplant, it's incredible because I meet some patients that only have days to live, and then I get to see them leave the hospital and ring our discharge bell. I think that's so special. And I really just love getting to know my patients because some of them I've known for about eight years because I see them for their pre-transplant eval. And then I see them possibly when they get a VAD and then they've had their VAD for two years and they finally get a transplant. So I really love establishing these relationships with my patients and helping them learn to love food and have a good relationship with food that promotes, you know, longevity and to seeing them be really healthy. That's beautiful. I feel like, you know, you're a big help to the transplant team for sure. And first of all, I have a million notes from today. So <laughs> you're helping not only your own patients, but a lot of other people out there too. So thank you. You're so yeah, I, Thank you so much for, for talking with us. And I agree, it's an incredible story. And I love how you've used your own personal background. Um, to find your way into this field. And now that you've used what you've learned to help transplant patients. And um, I think it's really, really amazing what you're doing and very impressive. Well, thank you. I think you both of y'all are very impressive too. I really enjoyed listening to the podcast about how you balance being a patient and a physician yourself. So you guys are really, really, y'all are amazing. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank if any you. of you guys out there have any questions um, for Madeline, you can always reach her at uh, her Instagram, which is at Transplant Nutrition. And before we let you go, is there anything else you wanted to plug or anything while we have you here? No, I don't believe so. I mean, maybe in like 10 years when I finally finish my nutrition book, I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> if we're still podcasting in 10 years, you are more than welcome <laughs> to come back. But thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. Thank You're you. Um, such valuable information. Yeah. Well, I hope so. All right. So that's our episode today. Thanks for listening to us at both sides of the stethoscope. Feel free to email us at both sides of the stethoscope at gmail.com for any questions or comments that you guys have. Um, also, we want you guys to follow us. Our Twitter and our Instagram are both at both sides of the stethoscope. So we'll yeah, thank you everyone for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and like the podcast either on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts downloaded. And we will see you soon. Uh, hopefully again in two weeks. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>